All right, here we are. It's time for the grand finale of uh, our uh, somewhat brief, I cannot too brief exploration of uh, Nietzsche's birth of tragedy. So we left off right in the middle of this, uh, this tension that, that Nietzsche finds between the Socratic approach to art, uh, for lack of a better word, or at least his, his sort of, uh, uh, his critical gaze uh, of art, which he shared with Euripides, the last of the great tragic poets, not so great in Nietzsche's mind, okay? It seemed to Socrates that tragic art did not even tell the truth, not to mention that it addressed itself to him who has no great understanding, a crime for Socrates, right? To be beautiful, you have to be intelligible, I suppose, and understandable. That's the Socratic creed, remember, from the previous video. Consequently, it did not recommend itself to the philosopher Greek tragedy, right? A twofold reason for shunning it. Like Plato, he reckoned it among the seductive arts, which portray only the agreeable, not the useful and hence he required of his disciples abstinence and strict separation from such unphilosophical temptations. But where unconquerable natural tendencies struggled against the Socratic maxims, their power, together with the momentum of his mighty character, was still enough to force poetry itself into new and hitherto unknown cha channels. So despite um, Socrates's animosity towards or questioning of you know, his critical eye towards the arts, he, you know, his new way of seeing the world, his new world view, uh, found its way and channeled its way through the arts and produced a new art form, right? So they did produce, uh, just like the, uh, the crappy plays of Euripides, at least crappy by Nietzsche's standards, created comedy, a new art form. <clears throat> the Socratic, right, Socrates himself gave birth to another art form. So if tragedy had absorbed into itself all the early varieties of art, the same might be also said in an unusual sense of the Platonic dialogue, which with a mixture of all the then existent forms and styles, hovers midway between narrative, lyric, and drama, between prose and poetry, and so also, or sorry, and so has also broken loose from the older strict law of unity of linguistic form. Right, so that he, he's at least giving a little bit of praise to Plato, the artist, that he's able to mix all of these different elements in different forms together, which was an innovation. The Platonic dialogue was a sort of boat in which the shipwrecked ancient poetry was rescued with all her children, crowded into a narrow space and timidly submissive to the single pilot Socrates. They now launched forth into a new world which never tired of looking at the fantastic spectacle of the procession. The fact is that Plato has given to all posterity the prototype of a new art form, the prototype of the novel. So Nietzsche sees in the Platonic dialogue a prototype for the modern you know, 19th century, 20th century, 21st century now novel, um, which he thinks can be described, maybe not the modern novel, maybe not like the contemporary, but certainly 19th century, this can be described as an infinitely developed Aesop fable. We talked about this at the end of the last video. Nietzsche claims the Aesop fable is the only form of art or poetry that, Nietzsche, that Socrates understood. I didn't mention this in the last video, but apparently when Socrates was in jail, according, according to Plato's account, um, when Socrates was facing death, before he was executed, he tried to create, he tried to write poetry. Uh, and so what he did was he took Aesop's fables. This is supposed to be a, a statue of Aesop, we're not sure, but you know, Aesop, the, he's a, for, a former slave that, that, that is famous for all these stories, tortoise and the hare, etc. But anyway, when Socrates was dying, he composed poems based on Aesop's fables, right? And the modern novel is an infinitely developed Aesop fable. I guess that the Platonic dialogue has, has uh, parallels as well, right? There's supposed to be some moral to the story. So Socrates kills tragedy, right? This, the Platonic dialogue, I suppose, rises from the ashes of all previous art forms, but it, it's, it's a price that has to be paid, the death of tragedy. In light of this new Socratic optimistic stage world, what becomes of the chorus and in general of the entire Dionysian musical substratum of tragedy? Optimistic dialectic drives music out of tragedy with the scourge of its syllogisms, right? These 
you know, in Greek logic, you know, these, these two premise arguments, okay? Uh, that is, it destroys the essence of tragedy, it becomes too rational, too intellectualized, right? Which can only be interpreted as a manifestation, illustration of Dionysian states. The tragedy is, the essence of tragedy is this, right? It's a manifestation, an illustration through Apollonian play of Dionysian states of ecstasy and abandonment as the visible symbolizing of music, as the dream world of Dionysian ecstasy. Though there can be no doubt that the most immediate effect of the Socratic impulse tended towards the dissolution of Dionysian tragedy. Yet a profound experience in Socrates' own life impels us to ask whether there is necessarily only an antagonistic relation between Socratism and art, and whether the birth of an artistic Socrates is in general a contradiction in terms. We talked about in the last video that the Socratic impulse is one that dissuades. The Socratic demon, right, is one that dissuades from creativity. But Nietzsche says, does there necessarily have to be this contradiction between creation of art and the Socratic approach, between Socratism and art? Maybe not. For that despotic logician had now and then, with respect to art, the feeling of a gap a void, a feeling of misgiving, of a possibly neglected duty. As he tells his friends in prison, there came to him one and the same dream apparition, which kept constantly repeating to him, Socrates, practice music. The voice of the Socratic dream vision is the only sign of doubt as to the limits of logic. Perhaps, thus he must have asked himself, what is not intelligible to me is not therefore unintelligible, right? So just because these poets can't explain why their poems are great doesn't mean that they're not, right? Just because I can't understand it doesn't mean it's not understandable or it's not, it's just, it's completely absurd. Perhaps there's a realm of wisdom from which the logician is shut out. Perhaps art is even a necessary correlative and a supplement to science. This is where Nietzsche's getting pretty controversial. Um, he's starting very subtly, right? But he's going to, by the end of this lecture, we're going to see, and for definitely for sure, these are the seeds of the later Nietzsche developing. He's going to see science itself as an answer to Silenus, right? As an answer to existence, as giving life purpose. Just the way Greek tragedy helped us, you know, helped the Greeks um, uh, to, to, to somehow... Um, face the harshness of existence in a way that was triumphant, just as the Homic epic, the tradition that was, um, that was brought about through the, the, the tradition of the Homeric epic poem was an answer to that. Science as well is, is a, an aesthetic approach, an aesthetic approach to answering that question of why and, and giving life and existence a purpose. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, and he's saying here, look, maybe, you know, maybe this demon voice uh, was telling him something, and perhaps he had an inkling that um, he was missing out on something, that art had something to say. And he thinks that, you know, Nietzsche thinks that um, Socrates, this, this um, scientific Socratism, right, so I don't know the right way to say it, um, had an influence that reverberates throughout all subsequent art history. This influence again and again involves a regeneration of art, yea, of art already in the most metaphysical, broadest, and profoundest sense. This is where he's opening up that term art in a way that I don't think a lot of philosophers will want to follow him, uh, including Schopenhauer, right? His, his, his in, big influence at this time. So this is where I think he's treading new waters, right? Um, you know, he's treading new ground. Uh, Nietzsche is saying, look, in the broadest sense, right, this is art, the Socratic approach to try to make everything clear, to try to make everything intelligible. And if it's not intelligible, it's nonsensical, right? It needs to be shunned, right? It's not beautiful. Um, so this influence, it, 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 it again and again involves a regeneration of art in the most broadest metaphysical sense. Right, art as a worldview, as a way of approaching life, of approaching existence, a story we tell ourselves, a narrative we tell ourselves as a, as a culture, as a society, as an individual. Its own eternity is also a warrant for the eternity of art. So this is an eternal need, this need to answer Silenus, right? Silenus that says that we should never have existed and the next best thing is to die quickly. 
And uh, we have to have an answer to this. Nietzsche thinks that we can come up with an answer, but because of Socrates, things have become a bit more complicated. And his influence, again, is seen in, in what Nietzsche calls the, a new type of man, a new type of individual. There's the Dionysian element in us, there's the Apollonian element of us in us, but now there's this new Socratic element that's a part of our character, right? That is, that is um, exemplified in, in Socrates. In order to endow Socrates with the dignity of such a leading position, right, of having this big influence on all art, art in the broadest sense, art as an answer to the great question of why, why, why live, right? Why not just not live at all with all the suffering and, you know, all the um, insecurities and, 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 and questions that we never have answered about life and all the things that we love and lose and all this stuff. How do we answer that great, that great abyss that calls out to us, right? Uh, art does this, right? Art, art, and, you know, the broadest Nietzschean sense, of Nietzsche, right? Not, not Schopenhauer, <clears throat> the Nietzschean sense as this sort of answer, this worldview, this perspective. So why do we give Socrates the leading position in in introducing this new approach, right? This, this wider view of art, this, this new way of aesthetics. It's enough to recognize in him a type unheard of before him, not the Apollonian, not the Dionysian artist, but the type is the theoretical man. Like the artist, the theorist finds an infinite satisfaction in the present and like the former, also the satisfaction protects him from the practical ethics of pessimism with its lynx eyes shining only in the dark. Whenever the truth is unveiled, the artist will always cling with rapt gaze to whatever remains veiled after the unveiling. Right, so he wants to, like Schopenhauer says, keep staring at the, at the, at the world, right? Despite all of its horrors, he finds inspiration in it. He keeps looking and looking. You know, he's done his artwork, yeah, y'all enjoy it. I'm still looking at what hasn't been unveiled yet. But the theoretical man gets his enjoyment and satisfaction out of the cast off veil. He finds his highest pleasure in the process of continually successful, successful unveiling affected through his own unaided efforts. So he gets meaning, the scientist, the theoretical man, gets meaning through the search, the search for truth, right? The search is where his purpose comes from. Why exist? To find knowledge. And this, this search really never ends. And that's why, according to Nietzsche, Lessing, the most honest of theoretical men, boldly said that he cared more for the search after truth than for truth itself. In saying which, he revealed the fundamental secret of science to the astonishment and indeed to the anger of scientists. Right? So, you know, the scientists can say, I just care about the truth, I'm objective. <clears throat> All I want to do is find out what's, you know, what the, you know, purpose, not the purpose, but what the, what the meaning is. Uh, even meaning's the wrong word, right? The how, how does this happen, right? What are the mechanics behind it? What's the cause? What's the effect? That's all I care about is knowing the truth. But it's just the search itself. That's the passion behind. That's the drive behind the real scientist, the one who really keeps looking and under that microscope, one discovery big deal. It's maybe there's that moment of satisfaction and that moment of, of composure and equilibrium, but then there's other unanswered questions, right? And then that's fine for the scientist, but he doesn't see it that way. Sometimes he lives under some sort of illusion, right? So there's this sort of scientific illusion that, 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 that Socrates himself embodies, right? So what is uh, Nietzsche talking about here? What, what is Socrates' illusion? Well, to be sure, beside this detached perception, right? That's the theory, I'm detached, I'm just theorizing, I'm just analyzing, right? Beside this detached perception, there stands with an air of great frankness, if not presumption, a profound illusion, with, which first came to birth in the person of Socrates. This illusion consists in the imperturbable belief, you're not gonna sway him on this, that with the clue of logic, Thinking can reach to the nethermost depths of being, and that thinking can not only perceive being, but even modify it. So not only can we know everything about everything, but somehow, at one point in time, we'll be able to control it, right? This sublime metaphysical illusion is added as an instinct to science, right? This is the instinct that drives Socrates. 
not the Dionysian, not the Apollonian, right? This theoretical impulse to know, to uncover, to you know, find secret cogs behind all there is, but you're not gonna do this, says Nietzsche, right? This instinct to science again and again leads the latter to its limits, where it must change into art, which is really the end to be attained by this mechanism. That's why we're scientists, as Nietzsche is arguing, the end to be attained by being this type of a person, the Socratic person, the theoretical man. The end to be attained, right, is, is art, right? It is art, right? And this is, I, I'm using, I'm gonna use one example to try to make this clear as I can. <clears throat> Perhaps if you're a physicist, you're probably gonna hate this example, so forgive me, right? But just for clarity's sake, you might think of the Big Bang as, as an aesthetic theory, right? It's sort of, well, here we go. We're gonna to try to answer every question about matter and energy in the universe and sort of why this does that. And so you can talk all about this particular situation and this, this mass here applied this much force, this much whatever, but where did it all come from, right? Eventually you're gonna trace it back to this one particular point and we can't really go back in time and sort of know all this stuff, it's highly speculative. So what you end up with are different cosmologies. You, you end up with different speculative theories like the Big Bang Theory. Nietzsche would say that's aesthetics, that's an, that's, that's an artistic theory, right? It's definitely, it's different, I suppose, than the theology of the pagan, the Greeks, right? The Homeric theology, but in a sense, it, it gives us a, 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 a world picture, it gives us a world view. Right? It's, it, it's similar in that regard, okay? It might be based on the scientific method and observation and experimentation, but the result of it is a, uh, what at least pretends to be a complete worldview and an answer to the question of why and a purpose, right? And, and really that's, that's what, you know, if, the, if the, the Homeric epic, then that tradition that, that, that was born out of it gives a sort of repose to the Greek, if the Greek tragedy gives also a similar kind of repose, a reflection of one's own suffering on stage and a way to sort of let go of one's sort of own personal problems and become one with that work of art, then science, I guess this pursuit for science is an, also another form of life. It's another form of approaching life, another sort of perspective. Uh, and, and for Nietzsche, it's got its own aesthetic. It's got its own, it, it, in, in a sense, it is an aesthetic. It is, it, it's just another form of art. Right? Science is another form of art. Very controversial claim, right? A lot, of, a lot of philosophers hate Nietzsche for this very reason, right? They think he's anti-science, which I think is a misreading of him. I think he put a great affection for modern science, but he did think, it, again, it was illusory. It had an illusion if it thought it could do this, if it thought it could somehow you know, use logic, thinking, and reach the nethermost depths of being, right? And not only perceive it, but, but modify it. He, he thinks this is, <clears throat> this is a naive assumption of Socrates' philosophy and, and of science in general. So for him, the, this, this clear divide you have throughout philosophy between mythos, a mythology, and a logos, a sort of rational account, that this, that this dichotomy is false. It's a false dichotomy. You know, for, for Nietzsche, up to a certain point, your logos is a mythos, right? Your, your science, your art, your explanation of reality and why things are, whether you're saying it's raining because Zeus is angry and it's thunderbolting because he's mad, right? or whether you're saying it's raining because of condensation, et cetera, et cetera. Right? For him, you're, you're telling a, a story. Again, very controversial claim, but you know, and I, I think that he would not like what people would do at this problem. Like, you know, the post, some of the postmodern philosophers take, take this uh, further than I think he, he would allow. But nevertheless, this is Nietzsche, right? I'm just going to say that, that, that in a certain sense, science itself is no different than a sort of Homeric version of the world or the, the Dionysian uh, Greek tragic uh, approach to light, right? They're all aesthetic in a certain sense. They're all artistic um, justifications for the terribleness of existence. If we now look at Socrates in light of this idea, and he appears to us as the first who could not only live, but what's far greater, also die by the guidance of this instinct of science, and hence the picture of the dying Socrates as the man raised above the fear of death by knowledge of reason is a sign above the entrance gate of science reminding everyone of its mission namely 
to make existence seem intelligible and therefore justified. So that's how Socrates justifies existence, right? Like the, the Homeric gods justified human existence by living it, as Nietzsche says earlier, right? We saw our own foibles, we saw our own misgivings, our own shortcomings, even in the gods themselves, even they had issues, even they had problems, right? Science justifies existence in a different way, right? By making it intelligible. For which purpose, if arguments are not enough, myth must also be used, right? This is where we get to the theoretical, right? Big Bang Theory, no, it's this, you know, whatever. Right? Um, black holes are this, black holes are not bad, right? Uh, myth must also be used, which I've just indicated as a necessary consequence, as the very goal of science. So science is there not just to, uh, for technical reasons, right? It's there as a answer to Silenus, as a sort of answer to the way of life, okay? But is it enough? Is it really enough? Nietzsche doesn't seem to think so, right? We'll talk more about this when we get close to the end of the video. But science as it's practiced today, uh, I think Nietzsche would argue is a bit too sterile, right? It's completely purged of those Dionysian elements. And so it can't appeal to um, all of our human faculties. It can't really provide a robust enough answer to Silenus. But let's continue here. As against this practical pessimism, Socrates is the prototype of the theoretical optimist who, with his belief of the explicability, you know, being able to explain the nature of things, uh, attributes knowledge and perception, or sorry, attributes to knowledge and perception the power of a universal panacea. And an error sees evil in itself, right? So error, making mistakes, that's wrong. Being correct, being intelligible, being understandable, that's right. That's the universal panacea. To penetrate into the depths and to distinguish true perception from error and illusion seemed to the Socratic man the noblest and even the only true human calling. Anyone who experienced in himself the joy of Socratic perception and felt how in constantly widening circles, it seeks to embrace the entire world of phenomena will thenceforth find no stimulus urging him to existence more forcible than the desire to complete the conquest, right? To understand it all, to see this full picture, to draw the net impenetrably close. But again, this is an illusion. One cannot do this, right? Here then, in a mood of agitation, we knock at the gates of the present and the future. Will that transforming lead to ever new configurations of genius and especially of the music practicing Socrates? That's the element that's missing. Socrates could never do it. He could never become the artist. He could never, he tried, right? He, like I mentioned <clears throat> earlier in the video, he tried to write poems when he was in jail, but he kind of gave up because he wasn't that good at it, right? Um, but is it possible, right? We need this, right? This is the cover to one of Nietzsche's later books, right? Uh, from what's considered his middle period, right? This is the Freude uh, of Wissenschaft, right? The, the joyful wisdom or the joyful science, or it's usually translated the gay science. That's kind of throws people off because nobody uses the word gay in the Fröhliche. It's not joyful. It's, you know, damn, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, the, the point is the gay science, the happy science, the joyful science, right? Not the sterile, everything has to be intelligible, right? We have to sort of somehow come up with an artistic type of science, if that makes any sense. Now, the German word for science that's being translated here, Wissenschaft, has much broader connotations than the English word science, right? When we hear the word science, we're typically thinking about biology, chemistry, um, or physics, right? We're talking about the hard sciences, okay? But in German, Wissenschaft is a much broader term. It can mean, you know, English is a, is a Wissenschaft, right? Or, or German, if you're German, Deutsch, if, you, if you're learning your, your, your language. It's, it's, it's a craft, it's a discipline, it's anything that has rules and regs and standards and norms. And so science, in that sense, theory, right? Uh, in a very broad sense. For, for Nietzsche, theory, science, it's art. It's, it's an art form but it, it lacks music, right? There's no music. It doesn't, it doesn't come from the soul, right? It doesn't come from that part of our soul, that Dionysian element, that direct primal element, right? That he thinks is the substratum for all art, right? The, the scientific approach tries to squeeze that out and make everything clear and precise and known. 
will the net of art which is spread over the whole of existence, whether under the name of religion or science, be knit ever more closely and delicately, right? So it's not just science, but religion is thrown in here, right? It's another worldview, it's another aesthetic approach to existence. Or is it destined to be torn to shreds under the restlessly barbaric activity and world which calls itself the present? It's not really quite sure. He could be talking about the present in general sense, right? Like I'm just thinking about the, 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 the moment. Remember, he was very critical of Euripides. Uh, we talked about this in previous lectures. Euripides would uh, represent the common folk on stage and all they cared about was the moment. They weren't thinking about their progeny. They were just like so borne down by the slavery of life that that was the burdens of the present were what was calling them, right? Or he might be talking about the, uh, the late or mid to late 19th century, right? Is it, is it, is it, are we gonna get wrapped up in politics and all this stuff? Are we gonna think about a vision for the future, a vision, a worldview? And he was very hopeful of this. He thought that uh, his buddy and mentor, uh, a former mentor, he had a big breaking out with him, but he thought Richard Wagner um, was the big hope. He thought that the operas of Richard Wagner, and you know, when Nietzsche knew him, he was really coming to prominence. He was a big rising star. You know, they had just built this huge opera house just for him and Bayreuth, okay? So Nietzsche thought that this, the German opera of, of, of Wagner would be a way to reinvigorate, right? A sort of cultural revolution. So art could save us again, right? Art could be our savior, right? This sort of gay science, right? Um, but he had his hopes just squashed pretty soon after writing this essay. Uh, for one, the essay was not well received. It was very controversial at the time, pretty much wrecked his career. And so he had a really awesome job, you know, before he even received his doctorate, he was the head of philology, right? He was a classical philologist, studied classical languages and, and, and classical texts. And he was given this post uh, in, in Basel, Switzerland, as the head of the, the university there. But once this book was published, it was not well received. The, the classical scholars did not like his interpretation. They, they thought he was just off his rocker and all this stuff was crazy. Now, I mean, even though he doesn't provide as much evidence as he probably should for some of his, uh, his theses, uh, his view of Greek tragedy and, and classical thought is not quite as controversial today as it was when he published this book, right? But anyway, he gives up on Wagner. Wagner, uh, you know, once Wagner starts getting much more um, nationalistic, uh, you know, Nietzsche apparently got nauseous uh, watching, uh, I think it was Tornheiser, one of his operas, Nietzsche stormed out of never to talk to Wagner again. So after this is published, uh, things don't go so well for him, okay? So um, I mentioned, I think in the first video, and probably throughout this whole uh, lecture series, I've talked about how Nietzsche disowned this early work and, and how the later Nietzsche differs a lot uh, from, from the earlier Nietzsche. But there's, there's some elements here, I think, that he maintains later on in his career. The notion of the Dionysian Apollonian, this is something, these are terms that he never uses again in any of his subsequent writings. I think it's kind of, you know, it'd be interesting to hear how he would, what, what he would think about how influential though these terms are. Most art critics, art theorists, uh, they use these terms and assume you know what they mean, right? They, they become very ubiquitous in art theory. Um, so I, I, I'm wondering how he would feel about that. I mean, I think when, in the end though, ultimately he would still maintain his position that there are elements of the human, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the human being, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, the human organism, there, there are elements of us that are Dionysian, right? There are those elements that seek out passionately these, these, these uh, uh, experiences of intoxication and, and elation, right? And, and, and in which we feel at one with our surroundings and sort of everything sort of works out very nicely. And then of course there's that Apollonian in us, right? That, that sense of, you know, I need meaning and, and, and I find uh, meaning in fantasy, right? I, I go and get lost in this fantasy world and it kind of gives my life purpose. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, again, we, might, we not, might not be aware of this. Nietzsche thinks it's something we naively adhere to, but that's something that's in us, right? So, um, and is it in art, right? This is something that is debatable, whether or not certain art is Dionysian or Apollonian. And I, I, I think he's got something going on here, right? He's not the first philosopher that we've looked at this semester to talk about the creation of art as something that's very spontaneous. And that itself, right, uh, leads itself to a Dionysian interpretation. 
whether or not these previous philosophers used that terminology, yeah, that's definitely not, not the case. Um, but certainly he's not pointing to something that is um, a phenomenon that's completely beyond the pale, something that you've never heard of or seen or probably can't relate to, at least yourself. If you're an artist yourself, if you're a performer, maybe you know what he's talking about, if you, especially I think a musician, right? Music is a, a, a primarily Dionysian art. If you're a performance artist, right? These sort of things, when you're in your element, when you're really performing your best, you know, there is this sense of abandonment, right? Uh, abandonment in the sense of just letting yourself go, right? Just becoming one with the piece that you're involved in, right? Again, this is something interesting about Nietzsche that I think is new. Uh, he didn't really borrow this, you would say, from Schopenhauer. This is something where uh, uh, art, myth, and religion are, are a projection of our culture. We see the art that is, that is created and performed and celebrated as a reflection of the worldview of the culture. That's an interesting point that he makes. How much weight it has is, I suppose, debatable. I, I tend to think he's onto something here. And this is definitely something new, right? We haven't seen uh, in any of the previous philosophers that we talked about. Now, you know, Plato obviously talks about, you know, art in a political context, right? Because he's concerned about the effects of art on the citizens of his republic. Um, but no one's really talked about art, at least so far in this class, art as a reflection of a sort of uh, a religion or worldview or way of life. Okay. Uh, Schopenhauer, you, you might argue, comes close, but I think Nietzsche really focuses on this, and that's definitely something that I find value in, uh, and I think he's got some interesting things to say. Now, Nietzsche himself, if you've ever heard of him, you probably know about this, this concept or this, this theory of the death of God, right? That's what he's most famous for, that he, you know, he wrote in, in this book, um, The Gay Science, <clears throat> he, he, this is the, fir the first uh, book where he apparently, uh, I guess, yeah, it is the first book where he uh, proclaims the death of God. And this is a concept of his, I think, that gets widely misinterpreted, misunderstood. What does he mean that God is dead? Well, he's using God as a metaphor here, right? God is a cultural myth, right? For him, he's, he's atheist, right? So he does not believe in the Christian God. But God in this, this sense is, is any sort of worldview, right? And he thinks that we've kind of killed this, right? God is, <clears throat> God is the, the sort of uh, culmination, really, I should say. It's not any worldview, but it's the culmination of all these previous worldviews. We've talked about, you know, in previous videos, in the Greek culture, you have the worldview of the Titans, right? the, the, the Titan mythology, which was kind of more austere and, and frightening. And this gave rise to a more joyful Olympian theology, right? A worldview based on the Olympic gods, right? And that morphed into tragedy, right? And then eventually we get to Socrates and we get to philosophy and, and then we get to Christianity. And so for Nietzsche, Christianity is like the culmination of all these previous approaches. And it's this sort of, you know, not only does it have this sense that we get in Socrates of completion, Right? So everything that, 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 that is about the universe, all the underlying truths of the universe can become intelligible, I suppose, through, 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 through divine revelation. And you know, maybe after you die, you go to heaven, you can see it all, that sort of thing. Right? It's all merged in the sort of, you know, the Christian deity. And for Nietzsche, by the time he's writing this in the 19th, 19th century, he thinks that European culture has killed this notion, right? Um, it tried to live up to this standard of, you know, perfection, truth, uh, knowing everything, uncovering all truths, uh, using logic and philosophy to uncover all truths about God and ethics and politics, etc. And through that process, we gained a lot, but we also killed God, says Nietzsche. So we've come to this realization where the, all these theories that we have sort of lived under, all of these frameworks, these, these, these cultural frameworks with which we have answered Silenus, right? We, we, we kind of given Silenus this answer. Before we were just naively operating under these systems, we, we just sort of took them as given. If you were a Greek living in the ancient Greece, you just believed that Zeus was up there. You didn't think about it, right? You actually, you know, it, it, you, you embodied it. You embodied that belief in your life. 
and similar for, I guess, the medieval Christian. They embodied that belief system uh, naively, Nietzsche would say, right? It was something that they just, but now that veil has been lifted in a certain sense, Nietzsche thinks in modernity, what characterizes us is that, I guess, Silenus is in our face and we have this sort of, you know, I guess as a culture, maybe not as individuals, but culturally in general, we become more secularized. God is, is dead. And instead of us sort of having an answer given to us by our art, given to us by our the sort of worldview or cultural narrative that we inhabit, we're presented with a bunch of options, right? We're kind of told that, hey, you're on your own as an individual. You have freedom, which is a great thing, liberty. And now you can be this kind of a Christian or that kind of a Christian, or you want to convert to another religion or that, you know. So we have all these options. We're like at a buffet table of ideologies. And for Nietzsche, um, that th this means that the next two or three centuries, he thinks the next two centuries, are going to be uh, some of the most violent in human history because now that there's this opening, there's this void. Um, you know, there's really no overarching uh, cultural narrative that we all just adhere to here in the West. We've got so much freedom that it leaves open this void of confusion, and will either sort of lead us to this nihilistic despair. We look at Silenus in the face and we agree with them. Existence is not even worth bothering with, right? It's better to not even exist at all or to die soon, right? So we, we go to that extreme and we sort of give up, right? I don't even know who, who's right. Look at all these different theories. Look at all these political ideologies. I don't even know which one to, to trust, right? We, we end up in that, that nihilistic despair or we cling to a dogma, right? We find some sort of ideology that gives us comfort, that gives us hope, and we just sort of doggedly, you know, uh, attach ourselves to it um, and become sort of ideologically possessed by, by this dogmatism, right? And so Nietzsche thinks this is a problem. And in his middle period, right, after he's done writing Birth of Tragedy, he moves on to other works like, you know, uh, uh, Daybreak and, and uh, um, uh, what else did he write before he does... Uh, uh, the gay science. Well, anyways, what, what's, what's often called his middle period, where he starts looking at this question, where he introduces this problem, and he sees art as a savior, right? He thinks science, this sort of scientific worldview, born out of Socratic, Platonic philosophy, this very austere, technical, rational approach to the world is just too sterile. What we need is a gay science, a joyful science, you know, the Fröhliche Wissenschaft, right? Um, and so for him, art is what is going to provide us with this. And so he's pretty optimistic about that. Now, later in his career, he seems to broaden this, right? He doesn't seem to think the artist is someone we can put our hope in. Uh, again, this is debatable, too. There's different ways of reading Nietzsche. It's pretty clear in his middle period, he sees art as, as an answer to the death of God. Art will sort of save us. It, it'll, it'll provide us with... Uh, um, that element that's missing from, from the scientific approach, but it's debatable in his later work whether he maintains that or he lets go of that, right? He seems, I would say, he broadens it a bit, right? What, he'll, what he does is he uses the term, just like he does here, in a very, very broad sense, right? When he's talking about uh, art in the broadest, most metaphysical sense of the word. Where's that, where's that quote? Yeah, so art in the most metaphysical, broadest, and profoundest sense, right? Not just art as a painting, art as somebody sculpting something, but art as me approaching the void of existence and giving it purpose, giving it meaning, right? And, and this is not something to be confused with like the existentialism of Jean-Paul Sartre. I think Nietzsche thinks that ultimately we inevitably have to do what we're gonna do. He doesn't have, the, he, for him it's not like in the hands of one individual, I just define this stuff, right? The, these cultural worldviews are something that emerge as a, uh, I guess, a confluence of forces, okay? Greek tragedy was not invented by one person, right? It was all these Dionysian elements that had been welling up in previous art. And similarly with Plato, he's not just somebody by himself who single-handedly invents art. It was some, there were some cultural currents that gave birth to this, right? And so how are we going to uh, survive the sort of nihilistic despair and not jump into dogmatism. Well, if we had any hope for any of it, Nietzsche thinks, 
at least at this point in his career, it's through art. All right, well, I think I've spoken enough. I'm starting to lose my voice. I've been <laughs> giving so many lectures and trying to get all these videos out before the semester ends and we've only got a couple weeks. So I'll be posting. I'm probably gonna take a two or three day break and let, let my, uh, my voice heal, uh, you know, my throat to <laughs> sort of clear up. <clears throat> and then after that, we'll get started on John Dewey, right? We'll look at John Dewey and art as experience. We'll, we'll look at a lot of that book. We'll look at a pretty in-depth exploration. We're gonna skip a couple chapters. We don't have time for the whole thing, but um, hopefully you join us for that. I hope you enjoyed our exploration of Nietzsche. Uh, seems to be getting a lot of attention on, on YouTube. That's great. So uh, I guess if, if you like it, share it, subscribe. Uh, you know, I don't get anything for doing this. Uh, I can't monetize apparently until I have a thousand subscribers. So uh, this is complete charity at the moment, right? You can sound like a, a greedy capitalist, but yeah, hey, gotta, gotta pay the bills. Uh, maybe I will one day. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Uh, see you on the other side, hopefully, for John Dewey. Take care.